Cool. Uh, kia ora koutou. Thanks to everyone for joining tonight uh, for this webinar on discrimination and renting. Um, and thanks particularly to our speakers, Brody, Nick, Byron, and Leah, for sharing their insights and experiences with us. Um, unfortunately, Aaron and Emmeline can't make it tonight, but that is all good. Um, so Celine and I will be your facilitators. Um, so my name is Ruby. I've been a member of Renters United Tamaki Makoto branch since 2020. Um, and I also recently completed my master's, which explored the barriers and opportunities for renters in Aotearoa to engage in housing activism. So I'll just give some quick background to this webinar and renting and uh, Rangers United, and then I'll let each of the speakers introduce themselves and their work. Um, so Renters United is an advocacy group that augurs, ran organizes renters and campaigns to make renting in Aotearoa better for everyone. Um, so we recognize that decent housing is a fundamental human right and acknowledge that how the current housing system functions is a significant barrier to realizing this. Um, so a major factor contributing to this is the unequal relationship between renters and landlords and the ways in which this manifests, often, often leaving renters feeling powerless in their housing situations and border lives. So the idea for this webinar came from sharing experiences and discussions in branch meetings um, that brought attention to the fact that the already insecure nature of renting can be made worse through discrimination against, for example, someone's age, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and disability. Um, so discrimination in the housing system also functions more broadly at the institutional and policy levels and the broader structure level, um, often making it difficult for some people to even access housing in the first place. Um, so this webinar hopes to explore how different forms of discrimination operates within the housing system, um, recognizing how they interact and inform each other and with each other and how different people experience them. So we hope that potentially having a better understanding of the ways in which discrimination is experienced and its impacts might better equip us to organize against it. So I'll now hand it over to our speakers. They can introduce themselves and their work and then we'll get started. So Brody, I'm gonna hand over to you to just talk a little bit about yourself. Oh, kia ora koutou. I'm Paul Brody Fraser Tokawingawa. I'm a, a postdoctoral research fellow with Heikaima Oranga, the Housing and Health Research Program at the University of Otago based here in Wellington. Um, my focus is primarily on takataupui and LGBTIQ homelessness and housing instability. Uh, my PhD was specifically on homelessness and my current projects are looking at housing stability more broadly, um, including discrimination in the rental market, obviously. Um, yeah, that's me. It's lovely to be here. Um, Byron, if you want to introduce yourself. I knew I was going to mess that order up. We went through this before, but I knew it was going to happen. Kia ora, everyone. Um, my name is Byron Williams. Um, I'm currently a PhD student um, studying sociology with Waikato University. Um, but the research also exists within a broader um, research group um, called Wero, uh, which aims to understand the mechanisms of racism in Aotearoa and conducting research to understand and propose solutions to racism acting in various domains of um, a New Zealand society. Um, so my research itself um, aims to understand the mechanisms of racism in the rental sector to understand how racism is produced, reproduced, uh, the role it plays in the structures of the rental sector, but importantly, how racialized bodies experience um, those forms of discrimination in the rental sector. Um, to do this, I'm specifically looking at um, the experiences of African renters in Wellington. Um, and that's to assess how racism occurs in their rental experiences and then how it shapes their experience of the rental system and uh, housing generally. Um, I'll just want to go through the four main questions that are kind of in, not inspired, but is, is the research is focused on. Um, and that's looking at. Um, so first one is what are the experiences of African renters in Wellington, just generally speaking? Um, second, how do interpersonal, institutional and internalized racism shape the rental experience of Africans? Um, three, how do systems of racism operate to shape the geo geographical patterns and housing biographies of Wellington-based African renters? And four, what is revealed about the broader operations of institutional racism through observing these patterns and experiences? I'll probably do quite a bit of reading from my notes today, so yeah, that's me. 
Oh, good. Thanks, Byron. Um, Nick, do you want to go next? Thank you, Ruby. Um, kia ora koutou. My name is Nick Ruane. Um, I have been involved with the disability sector for quite a while. Uh, probably, I would imagine coming up around 15, 20 years now, um, been involved with Disabled Persons Assembly, um, elected to, to sit on the governing uh, body of that organisation, really proud to have served in, in DPA. Um, also, most recently, um, elected to sit on the um, uh, accessibility advisory group to Wellington City Council and that brings me to to talk uh, here today uh, where just in the last 12 months we we had a hui around housing and renting for disabled people here in Wellington and and we heard some stories from our disabled and um, whanau and community here in Wellington and, and some of the things that they're experiencing um, here where I live here in Wellington and um, yeah, so I'm just looking forward to having a discussion and, and, and giving us a contribution around some of the experiences that, that disabled people have in the rental market and also some of my own observations as well personally. So thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Um, Byron, did you want to introduce Leah now? No. Sorry, you're on mute. <laughs> Right. Um, yeah. you know, I, 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 in, I would like to give the floor to Leah. I don't want to misrepresent anything. Um, so Leah, if you feel free to speak, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, my name's Leah. I'm an uh, African New Zealander, uh, born in New Zealand. And um, I'm just going to be talking about my personal experiences with uh, getting housing uh, from about the 80s until currently. And, oh, yeah, my background, I am a host of a, a access radio show called The Black House. And uh, I have a degree, Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology and Sociology. And racism was one of the main things I studied at uni. Yeah. That's me. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, and I'll also just let Celine introduce herself because I forgot to earlier. <laughs> Hi, sorry. <laughs> Kia ora koutou everyone, I'm Celine, so I am um, co-hosting the second half, so chairing the second half, so um, no wonder Ruby forgot I was present. Um, I've also been involved in Renters United, kind of on the periphery now, but I'm, um, uh, I would think of myself as like a feminist urban geographer, so I'm trying to do a PhD at the moment as well, um, that's looking more at uh, public institutions and libraries, but in spaces like that, we really see the impacts of uh, all of these things and the housing crisis in New Zealand. So I'm really excited to be here and learn about a lot of everyone else's experiences and research in this space tonight as well. So I'll be back later. Thanks, Ruby. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we can pretty much go straight into the first um, question, which is kind of, I guess, introducing um, the forms of discrimination that you're all researching and know about. Um, so the question is, what forms of discrimination are prevalent in your work um, and what factors might contribute to them? And how do these forms of discrimination impact people's ability to acquire housing um, and their broader lives? So just go in the same order. So Brody, if you would like to start. Absolutely. Um... Like that's quite a big one <laughs> to start with. Um, so for me, primarily in my work, uh, looking at discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity, but I think we can't really talk about uh, any of these kind of forms of discrimination in isolation. You know, they're often uh, intersecting with each other and people experience multiple forms of discrimination for all different things, you know, um, even in my work, there's kind of multiple layers of oppression that's going on. Um, and yeah, in terms of the way that it manifests and its impact, I think there's a lot of different kind of subtle ways that it manifests for people, whether it's, um, yeah, looking to find their own rental housing or trying to find safe and welcoming flats for people that can be quite difficult. And I think flatting in particular is kind of a little bit of a wild west um, in terms of you can kind of 
get away with anything and there's uh, even less regulation in that area than there is in uh, renting more generally. So that's quite often a um, site of pretty intense discrimination for people. Um, and I think one of the most obvious impacts of this that it has on people's lives uh, for me and my work is that it very frequently leads to homelessness um, in all its many forms for people. You know, if you're desperate and you can't find anything, um, kind of, yeah, it can lead to sort of worst case scenario, I think. But uh, also in terms of that, I think particularly in rainbow communities, something that does come out of that and the kind of um, prevailing norms of discrimination that people experience is a real sense of community care and support, I think, which um, I'm sure others will talk about as well. But I think that's something that really comes through in my work is the ways that uh, our communities have kind of worked together to support each other and to um, kind of mitigate some of those issues that we see within the rental market and the housing market more broadly and kind of uh, coming together when people need that support. Yeah, I think that's kind of generally. Awesome. Um, Byron, if you would like to go next. Kia ora. Um, yeah, so I, I'm probably talking very much more from a research standpoint. Um, in Aotearoa, unfortunately, there really isn't much information or data out there or literature discussing um, racism and housing generally, but even more specifically looking at um, the rental the rental market itself. Um, there really isn't much out there. Um, so much of the much of the information we have is quite anecdotal, whether that be through you know stories that you hear or the media that um, will uh, report on some stories that come through. Um, what I can say though is that there is international literature out there. It's very difficult to draw similarities between the two because they are um, different geographic locations. Um, but what the international literature does tell us, and majority of the studies are done in Europe or North America. Um, and they predominantly are done through um, field experiments, mostly audit studies um, and surveys. And audit studies uh, generally are when you get, you'll send, um, you'll, you'll reply to an email or, or you know, a phone call about an, uh, a rental property that's become available. And you'll have people send in um, I, virtually identical applications and they'll signify um, ethnicity in some kind of way, usually through name. Um, and what they what the literature tends to find is that um, people with ethnic names or the the the, the minor, minoritized ethnic group tend to get um, fewer fewer callbacks, especially by email. There seems to be a lot more discrimination by email on that. Um, they spend a far more time looking for apartments, um, and they get far more adverse treatment um, when they are in these spaces themselves. Um, so most of the measures that we come across in survey data is looking at yeah, so one of them is how how long they spend looking for a, a rental property. Um, so I'm just check my notes. Um, how many they view and how landlords interact with them or treat them in those spaces. Um, so that's generally what we see in the international literature. And unfortunately, a lot of those aren't um, qualitative research or, or uh, you know interviews or, or focus groups of those kind. Um, but what we have seen in terms of my the conversations I've had so far in my research, um, generally with, with what people find is that um, it's quite hard to get into rentals um, in the sense that landlords tend to be the ones discriminating. In a very similar sense that we see in the, in the literature, um, people have, have explained to me that they often get ignored when they check um, our rental properties. Um, and those that have parky partners will often find that people will speak to their parkia yeah, partners, but not them. Um, so they get treated quite poorly within those um, the circumstances. Um, one story I have been told, oh, what, what that involves myself, is that I had a Nigerian um, family friend who was looking for rentals and ended up asking me to go because I'm lighter skinned than they are. So there's often that anticipation of racism there too. Um, so yeah, in summation, unfortunately, we don't have much in Aotearoa. Um, but there is international literature to point to and a lot of anecdotes that I get told that you've seen in the media as well. Thanks, Byron. Um, cool, and we'll just pass to Nick. Yeah, kia ora. Um, thank you for the question. I've been thinking about this um, today and just trying to figure out how to 
how to how to break this one up. Um, I think from a disability perspective, um, there, there's two perspectives on this one. Um, there's the there's the soft and the hard. Um, the soft um, is is really around how how we describe the the discrimination of low expectation, and that's something that that really evolves around um, communities' low expectations of disabled people and, and what we can achieve, and that's really around people's um, really built up over a very very long period of time. Uh, a lack of expectation around around what we can achieve within society, and that's so. So that's where I would put that um, into into the soft side of things. Um, although it can get pretty hard sometimes when when someone places their expectation around around where where your life journey can end up. But but that's uh, um, that's on one side of it. Um, on the hard side of it, um, people can get pretty direct. With, with disabled people in terms of laying, um, like, like for example, uh, it, it, Byron has just spoken about being um, not spoken to, uh, not directly addressed, and, and that happens regularly for disabled people in a, in a um, say for example, you might go into a store and, and you just might, might not even be addressed at all. Uh, you might be ignored directly. Um, uh, yeah, so so those are examples like that. Um, in the employment context, um, we we deal with people that have hundreds and hundreds of of rejected um, employment applications um, for for roles that they're you know qualified or overqualified for. Um, Human Rights Commission reports in the disability area that employment is the number one area that they receive complaints for, and housing is the second highest area where they receive complaints for. Um, so in terms of bringing it contextually into the, the housing area, um, um, you might be you might be a disabled person applying for um, to live in a in a flat through the normal process, and the landlord might just say to you, "Sorry, um, but the flat's been rented already, so you have no idea whether that's in relation to an expectation of that landlord about." You as a person, or whether it's actually true, so you carry that with you as a as a person. Um, of course, there's also the other side of it that you might not not even be able to physically access that property. So there's also very real accessibility concerns um, because we know, um, certainly in my city, that only two percent of all properties are accessible. Um, <laughs> And, and we have 50,000 disabled people living in our city. Um, so those numbers aren't very good. Um, and disabled people live on some of the lowest incomes in our country. So when you stack those numbers up against each other, um, it's pretty, well, when I say it's pretty tough, I'm, I'm being flippant, but it's incredibly tough out there for disabled find out. And most times they tend to live at home or in some form of um, supportive environment with family, friends, uh, because it's just too tough out there. Um, so I also was thinking about the data question, which Byron raised as well. We don't have enough data about what's going on out there. So I would support that as well as being a real need. Um, so I think, I think I'll draw it to, to close there and um, we, can, we can move into next questions. So thank you. Cool, thanks, Nick. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna pass over to Selene who will introduce the next section. Kia ora again, uh, Selene here. Um, everyone, I feel like it's um, uh, a lack and the kind of lack of discussion point I think is why it's so useful this conversation's happening to kind of get disparate people working in this space up the flat you know my internet is uh potentially failing me am I all right Ruby or am I falling um you're a little bit glitchy <laughs> 
that's been lost. Okay. Um, all right, potentially, am I back? I think we might both be Ruby, that might be our problem. Um, can the speakers hear me okay? You can hear me okay? Okay, I'll move to the next question and then well, hopefully you can speak and I'll um, move closer to the router again. Um, so our next real question was that we wanted to talk a little bit more about experience. So um, either personal experiences or experiences of research where you've heard other people's um, uh, kind of uh, experience or uh, stories about how this may, how this may um, occur on the ground. And maybe since we haven't had a, a chance to hear from you yet, we might start with Leah, if that's all right. You can take it away whenever you like. Hi, okay. Um, all right, well, I've experienced racism in New Zealand throughout my life, both structural and interpersonal. I won't go into all those details. So I'll just go straight to, besides the obvious economic barriers to the private rental market for myself personally, it was the attitude of many real estate agents acting as middlemen between the owners and the renters. And they they have their established checklists um, that you're considered against. But there, there is the obvious checklist, which everyone complies with. And then there's the private checklist, which many are not privy to. So which includes passing on landlords' own biases. Um, an example of this, when I was homeless, I was homeless um, as a teenager between the ages of 15 and 18. Um, real estate agents uh, or landlords didn't want to, they didn't want to house homeless people. Um, they didn't want homeless people renting housing as homeless were considered not appropriate for housing because they were homeless, right? So there was a lot of discrimination against people of color getting into the private market and I'm thinking early 80s now. And one way was the pay to view method, which was made, uh, which made it difficult to view available housing unless you had money to pay the middleman. And you had to pay for each property you wanted to view. And they've since gotten rid of that system, but there's still covert ways that you are made ineligible for viewing or applications being turned down. Um, I think my experiences in my early life, I've preferred to stay in the public um, social housing sector and that's mainly for housing security. I currently rent with Wellington City Council. Um, I was in Australia for 10 years and during those 10 years, we had to move eight times and we were living in rental, private rentals. Um, and what was happening was the properties were being sold off or private owners living in buildings amongst renters um, could get you moved on for petty reasons like alarm clocks or food smells, right? So often the context for which you get turned down for housing remains covertly hidden from renters. Um, you're not encouraged to question the real estate agents about why you were turned down because uh, one real estate agent could be representing many landlords and they could make it difficult for you to secure another place. Um, you can get turned down. If you get turned down, you just have to accept the outcome. Sorry, I'm reading off notes. So <clears throat> it's also well known in New Zealand that landlords have their own blacklists of clients or potential renters. But as far as I know, um, there are no blacklists of landlords, real estate agents, and I think there should be. Um, I went to the next question, what factors cause or contribute to these forms of discrimination? Do you want me just to read those things that I wrote down? Yeah, you, anything you would like to reflect on in general would be really useful, so please. Okay. Um, so yeah, what factors cause or contribute to these forms of discrimination? I think this is just my own personal take. Um, unconscious bias being passed on, passing on landlords' discriminatory beliefs by real estate agents. Um, coded terms like exclusive accommodation became understood as rental properties for white business people, not just business people that could afford the housing. One such listing recently, um, I was helping some African friends of mine, uh, two guys, they were refused to even view. Um, we had applied to view um, several times and were told by the real estate agent not to bother replying. This property sat unleased for nine months. The landlord was in Australia and we were told she had several properties in Wellington, approximately 20, 
and she could pick and choose who she leased to. Both the guys I were helping to find accommodation had accommodation had full-time employment, a good credit history. One was a business owner and both were African. And we never got to view the property at all. It just They just refused to let us have a look. Another time a landlord blatantly told me, of course we were going to face discrimination because of race being African and that this was com a common and accepted part of the private rental market. And I have records of these experiences because I just thought it was important. Um, I also think it's the casual acceptance of these beliefs in the rental market in New Zealand um, that because housing's a commodity, landlords and by proxy real estate agents have the right to discriminate. We just, we just casually accept that. And there isn't much comeback for tenants or people looking for housing. So it took us close to 12 months actually to find accommodation for both of these guys and the first place we managed to get one of them into was leased out at $550 a week and it turned out to be an illegal structure. We found this out after signing the contract and trying to connect the internet which couldn't be connected because the property as an individual unit just didn't exist. So we had to go through Wellington City Council records to find out exactly what was going on and the real estate agents agent blatantly claimed that the structure was legal when it wasn't. And there was a usual bullying attitude towards us, you know, about trying to, you know, like, if you, if you argue with this point, they're going to make it more difficult for you to find housing in the future. And, but uh, we were determined to get out of the contract because uh, my friend needed the internet to run his business. So I advocated for him and challenged the real estate agent and threatened to go to court. And they eventually relinquished and returned all his money. They only tried leasing the structure again to migrant house seekers. So to me, it was like, okay, you want to le lease this illegal structure, but you're going to lease it to people that probably won't put up a fight. And um, eventually my friend did find a place to live after nearly 12 months. And uh, he, he managed to get a place from a friend who owns several properties. But let me tell you, the place has no insulation, dodgy wiring and electric sockets, no connected oven. He cooks off a bench top plate, a working, a working shower only on the ground floor, not on the second level where he lives. And it wouldn't pass a healthy homes inspection as windows are painted shut, et cetera. And the house has been used to hoard, but he has carved out a livable space for himself and doesn't want to complain about anything because he couldn't find a legal structure to live in in Wellington. And he doesn't want to go through that again. It's demeaning. He's a business owner. He owns actually two businesses. Um, personally, I don't trust the private rental market in New Zealand. I'm a single mother. Um, but my main private rental experience, most of it was in the 10 years I was in Australia. I have rented probably five times privately. Um, I've always, I've often felt over, except for one case, I often felt over monitored and um, that the rental accommodation could be removed at any time. And you don't feel like you have any control over your living situation, that a bad day for the landlord or real estate agent could have dire consequences for your own personal situation. You're, so you're walking on eggshells, no matter how well you keep the property. And I've always taken care of my properties like they were my own. The impacts on mental health is always being under stress or anxiety and your rental accommodation can be taken away from you at any time. Homelessness and couch surfing and living rough while still trying to hold down the norms of having a job is incredibly stressful and exhausting to do. You feel powerless. Um, you can't do anything about it because real estate agents re represent the landlord, not the tenant. And the experience of applying for property after property and not being given a reason for why you're being turned down is demeaning. But if you you know, it doesn't take much to figure out that race is playing a part. Um, and they can represent several properties, so they can blacklist you. And rents, rents keep increasing in the private market, and so it's difficult to pass all the tests to get into the private property thing. Housing in New Zealand has been pretty traumatising for me, um, you know, because I've had a homelessness situation. And the first place I ever got, uh my mum and my stepfather who I have a very strange relationship with 
um, actually got the place because you know it was it wasn't a very hard thing for them to do because they're both park here. Um, but this only happened because I was in a very dangerous situation on the streets. Um, I find Kaianga Ora and Wellington City Council is more secure housing, but they're not building them fast enough in Wellington. They're building the Kiwi builds, but what about, you know, Kaianga Ora housing? That, housing, that's what we need here. So uh, this means that if your Wellington City Council place becomes affordable, where do you go if you're on a fixed income or a pension? Um, security of housing is currently being threatened by Wellington City Council plans at the moment to move Wellington City Council housing into a community housing provider. And uh, with government income related rent subsidy only being available to the Kainga Ora housing uh, tenants, they get off the Kainga Ora housing register. And that, that community housing project's only going to have government backing for two years only. So, what happens after that? Um, current Wellington City Council housing tenants have been blocked from getting the IRRS, even though many of us would qualify to be on Kaingawara Housing Register and, and qualify for income related rent subsidy. And we don't know what will happen to us after the two years, you know, once it goes to a chip. We don't know, we don't even know what's going to happen once the rent freeze that's been in place since 2020 is lifted in 2023. Because as you know, in Newtown, Wellington, most of the houses, we pay 70% of market rate and most of the housing, um, the housing complexes that are in Newtown, for example, are surrounded by million dollar houses. So you can imagine what the market rate will be. And that's, and we're supposed to pay 70% of that. So it's quickly becoming a situation where affordable housing is becoming unaffordable. Um, I don't like the idea of Wellington City Council going to a community housing project. That's just my, I, I think that tenants have more control over the situation and more influence if housing stays with Wellington City Council and the government allows Wellington City Council tenants to access IRRS, the income related rent subsidy. Um, yeah. So basically what I've experienced in council is though when I first moved in, the rent was quite affordable. The rent has continued to go up and go up by even more incremental uh, points every year up until 2020. So we don't know what's gonna happen when, yeah, that rent freeze is lifted. And so quickly it's, uh, it's unsustainable, I think, like what's happening. And I don't really like the idea of going to a community housing provider. And yeah, that's that's it really. I think I think I've covered everything I can think of. <laughs> thank you thank you so much. We um I really appreciate you sharing with us. Um that's really useful and horrible. Um I feel like um, my experiences as a renter in New Zealand with privilege of so many other kinds in this country, feeling how insecure I feel, uh, that, that is really what got me so involved in this because I just cannot begin when we think of all the other intersections that people are uh, having to traverse in this country, um, how, how difficult it really is in the systems that we have created. Um, so we really appreciate you being here tonight and sharing your stories with us. Um, Byron, do you have anything you want to add before I pass on to Brody? Um, very, very briefly. Um, no, thank you for sharing your story, Leah. Um, we've known each other for quite a while, and I haven't heard all of it, so it's actually really cool to, to hear in this context now. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about, kind of piggyback on what you were saying about Leah, um, about the structure of renting as well, the fact that landlords have so much power, you know, because they have to make market decisions based on risk, um, you know, it puts them into a position where those kind of cultural and racialized narratives of racialized bodies will come to the fore and kind of it creates a structure in which um, systemically they're going to have much more opportunity to, to discriminate along those lines. Um, so, you know, it's this, this really interesting coming together of historical and, and, and contemporary um, cultural and racialized narratives of people 
Um, and then the position that they're given often allows them to do these, these forms of racial discrimination, which are often based on these narratives that have you know, a long colonial history of. Um, so yeah, thank you again, Lee. I just wanted to just jump in, just kind of state that a bit more. Kia ora, thank you, Byron. Um, I'll just quickly note before I pass to Brody that we're going to hopefully have time for a Q&A from our um, audience towards the end. So if you're, while you're listening, if you've got anything you'd like to hear elaborated on, any questions you have for the speakers, maybe make a note of them um, for a little while along, but I'll pass on to Brody. Thank you. Uh, kia ora. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess a lot of what has come up in my research is kind of quite similar to what uh, we've already been talking about in the sense of just the massive power imbalances in the housing market. I think they're huge and numerous and they kind of manifest in a lot of different ways. But um, I mean, in terms of uh, concrete examples, there's quite a lot that come to mind. Um, I think one of the main ones that I can think of is um, one of my participants, uh, and I think this was less than 10 years ago, so still relatively recently, he and his partner, who was a man, um, were looking for rental housing in Auckland. Um, and it was obviously very stressful and, uh, you know, very unaffordable, all those sorts of things. And they managed to find a place and their um, turns out their landlord was the neighbor, but it was done through a um, very well-known real estate agency. And as they were moving out at the end of their tenancy, the uh, landlord kind of came over and said to them, hey, we didn't want to tell you this at the time, but we just thought it was important for you to know when um, you were kind of being shown the house, the real estate agents came up to us afterwards and said, oh, you know, we know you've got children. Are you okay with there being two men living next door? And, just, you know, the landlord said, I just thought you should know that, but, that, that, but you know, we were fine with it, obviously. And um, the children had kind of become like family, but even just that, you know, of, like, that was 2014, I think that happened. So still quite recently. And um, just the power that real estate agents, I think, and property managers in particular have as well. So, I mean, landlords obviously have quite a lot of power, but I think that kind of intermediary, they do have, you know, as you were saying, Leah, the blacklists and the kind of hidden lists of what they will and won't allow. And that's even if you manage to get to that stage, you know, there's um, lots of times where participants, particularly trans participants, who it might be uh, more difficult for them to kind of pass or um you know kind of appeal to that cishet sort of norm um and they'll be emailing with landlords or property agents about viewing places and everything could be very positive and lovely and then they turn up to the viewing and the landlord takes one look at them and kind of says oh no you're you're not the person we want but uh tries to do it and often try to do it in more kind of subtle ways um so, you know, there's those barriers to getting into housing. And then when you do get into housing, you have so little agency and so little power that, you know, people are making all of these horrible trade-offs of, oh, you know, it, again, it took me, you know, people will take a year to find a place and find anything stable. So they put up with really, really horrible quality housing because they don't want to rock the boat or they're living with really awful flatmates who aren't accepting of them. But again, they know that if they leave, they're not gonna be able to find anywhere else. So it's kind of, people are having to kind of weigh up whether or not, you know, if you go to a viewing of a flat or a rental property of, do I present as myself where people could kind of, you know, realize that I'm part of the queer community or do I try and hide that part of myself? And I think it, totally depends on the person and it's different for people. Some people really do try to hide it because they're so desperate to find housing. Other people are kind of like, well, no, I can't hide it or I don't want to because then I'm going to end up in a really unsafe situation and that's happened before, so I don't want to do that again. There's all these sorts of things, you know, and I think a lot of it is just that kind of idea that, you know, the housing market and the people who are in power in the housing market uh, tend to have a lot of privilege afforded to them and look a certain way and have a certain kind of life experience. And if you aren't the same as them, then you're going to have quite a rough time, I think, generally. Um, yeah, and I think in particular, uh, flooding is kind of a site where things can go wrong quite badly. 
um, and can kind of cause chronic instability for a lot of people. I think those kind of relationships, um, I, I mean, I think it would go for any community, but in the queer community that comes up quite a lot is when those relationships can implode and the flatmate suddenly reveals that they're actually quite homophobic or they're very transphobic that can become pretty unsafe pretty quickly and cause a lot of instability for people and their housing experiences. Um, you know, like uh, one of my participants said once that the first flat she lived in, you know, she was forced to take the sleep out at the back of the house because all the other women in the house thought that she was going to be predatory towards them. And, you know, so they were like, oh, well, you know, you can't, you've got to go to sleep there. We don't want you to see us or we're, you know, wrapped up in our towel, leaving the shower kind of thing as if that was ever going to happen. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's so numerous and quite often can be quite subtle and hard to kind of prove, I think, which is another thing when you kind of think about, you know, how do we tackle this and how do we stop it? It's, um, you know, it's subjective. We know when we're being discriminated against and, you know, it's quite obvious to us, but if you have to kind of go and through a paper trail and prove it, it can be very, very difficult, especially if it's kind of more about people's actions and it's not kind of written things, you know, you'll see, um, I think in just the way that rental properties and flats are listed and posted about online, it's can people find a clever wording to kind of state what they want and, you know, get around things, I think. So that's a big issue as well. But um, yeah, that's kind of the main things that come to mind for me. Kia ora, thanks Brody. I feel like it's interesting um, hearing as well about how uh, flats are such a common experience for so many people or some form of co-living due to a whole range of reasons um, but they're not really part of this discussion when we talk about how people experience housing and how we regulate and and make people live in safer situations so that's a really interesting point as a space in which people are um, dealing in particular with a lot of um, difficult situations with no clear help in any way um, okay, I'll pass on to Nick now, um, if you don't mind. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Um, thank you. I, I was, I've just been listening and, and really reflecting on, on the points of um, crossover, um, and there have been a lot, so thank you to everyone for sharing. Um, I've just been thinking about the, the specific issues for disability community, and really around housing, um, it really came to a head when the UN Special Rapporteur for Housing came to New Zealand and, um, and, and did a bit of an inquiry around housing, particularly for disabled people, um, and issued a bit of a damning report uh, around the state of housing for disabled people here in New Zealand. Um, and, and off the back of that, um, we had a, a hui here in Wellington that our city council facilitated for our disability community. And um, there were some stories that came out of that that were quite um, eye-opening in terms of what uh, what disabled people here, where I live here in Wellington are experiencing. Um, so I'll, I'll just share a couple of those. Um, there, we all have celebrated the healthy homes um, uh, in terms of what it has done to make our homes more um, warmer and, and and more um, better to live in, but but what our disability community told us was that in order for our landlords to make their homes compliant with the law, um, there were many disabled whānau that were being turfed out of of homes in order to make the relevant um, work get the relevant work done, and. Um, so that was one of the unintended consequences that occurred as a result of healthy homes that we never really sort of understood was going to happen. Um, so again, it's that issue of um, people don't really want to kick up a fuss. They don't want to make a big fuss out of anything. And it's, it's the, if, if it's the only accessible home that you've ever known, you don't really sort of want to make a big deal out of it. And if your landlord's coming to you saying, well, I need this property for a month or, or whatever it is in order to do the healthy homes repair. Um, it's putting you in a very tricky situation in terms of where you go to um, to fit to, to actually 
to live for for that period of time. And for many people, they never got access back to that property. Um, they weren't offered it back again. Uh, it was then put back onto the re onto the rental market. So many people were effectively made homeless as a result of that process. So that's that's what we heard. Um, another interaction that that we had and heard about was um, people were would take a, a, a flat um, because it met maybe 80% of their needs. Um, but there wasn't, say, for example, an accessible bathroom. And bathrooms are usually the big ones. They're the ones that um, make or break an experience. Um, but everything else was there. Everything else met their needs. So we had people telling us that they were, um, uh, I don't know how else to put this, but they were having their, their showers and, and everything else in, in their working environments, which I, I just don't know how that, how that works. I'm, I'm not sure how people do that, but um, that that's what people do in order to secure a, a you know a place to live. So that's that's the reality of what some people are experiencing every day in, in our city. Um, it's it was pretty shocking to hear, but but that's that's going on today as we as we speak. Um, because I'm pretty sure it hasn't been resolved. I'm pretty sure there hasn't been an accessible bathroom put into every every flat in our city um, because of the two percent number I just put 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 out there earlier. Um, you know, in my own personal case, um, my own my own place where I live became completely inaccessible to me um, because I broke my ankle, which sounds completely innocuous, but um, when you have impairments like I do, um, when you break an ankle, it's a pretty serious thing. Um, so I, I have a flight of stairs up to the front door, and um, yeah, it was pretty scary to be honest. Um, when when I can't physically access, and because of my impairments, um, I can't use crutches. I can't use a wheelchair. You know, I, I, it just, it's just not an option. So somehow I managed to get in the front door, but from that point on, um, I was pretty much stuck in my, own, in my own place where I live for five weeks. And um, yeah, that's a pretty scary proposition um, in terms of accessing all the things that, that you need in terms of, you know, basics. Um, so that's, that's pretty scary. Um, so yeah, that's when accessibility becomes really, really important, and we just don't have the accessibility of our of our rental properties, of our houses. Um, so yeah, that was something. Um, but I mean, I, I feel privileged because I know that my my legs going to heal and I'm going to be able to walk again, walk up and down those stairs again. But you know, there's so many people in in my community that that's not an option for us. so um, but yeah it was a big wake-up call for me personally um, so um, yeah there's some people doing it incredibly tough out there and um, yeah it was a when we heard those stories um, it was pretty sobering to hear what people are living through and um, those stories were communicated back through to the UN Special Rapporteur and uh, that that advice, that report, I, I would recommend that people go and read it because it's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, thank you. Kia ora, thank you so much for sharing. It um, truly just seems like uh, that people are sacrificing so much and, and suffering in a sense when it's in our control and this doesn't have to be it's just why it seems so um cruel really to me we have a short time now to reflect on um what everyone thinks we might be able to do um to so I've got a little uh we've got a little bit of time now to think um kind of looking at the state of things that we all um know are horrendous in lots of different ways um so we're thinking if we're going to start to think about challenging these different forms of discrimination, how they're operating within housing. 
Um, we don't have much time, but maybe if everyone kind of picks one main or a few main things to talk about, what might need to happen to change how things stand in the current moment and what might help us get to a better place? Um, so maybe if we start with Brody again, um, and we've probably got um, a few minutes each to give then a few uh, a bit of time for questions from our audience as well, if that's all right. Great, yeah. Um, I mean, th there's a lot that comes to mind in, what, in terms of what needs to happen, particularly for Tukatapu and LGBTIQ communities. Um, I think, you know, more generally, we need more oversight and professional standards and code of conduct for landlords, real estate agents, property managers. Um, you know, I think they're thinking about that, but uh, it needs to happen and it needs to happen quickly. Um, I think also we really need to think about what avenues we have for reporting discrimination, particularly in the housing market, and thinking about the best ways to do that and to ensure that um, people can remain, remain anonymous in those situations if they need to report property managers or real estate agents just because of those power imbalances. And, um, you know, people are very scared to rock the boat when they know that they're going to end up homeless if they complain about anything or if they get evicted or kicked out. Um, and yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot that needs to be <laughs> changed, I think. Um, better support for our communities as well when we are struggling to find housing. I think that's a really key thing, um, particularly for Tukatapu and LGBTIQ communities. There's not really much uh, targeted housing or homelessness support out there for us just yet. It's kind of still an emerging area um, that's kind of happening and yeah, I mean, I could talk for a very long time, but I won't because we're running out of time. But um, I think those are kind of the main things. Um, and just, you know, in our day to day lives, kind of, you know, if we're seeing um, online, you know, listings for flats and rental markets, rental houses, sorry, that are really discriminatory, trying to call those out where we can and, um, you know, kind of engage with people around those uh, stigmas and different beliefs that they might hold. Um, yeah, and making, you know, classic active roots of activism, making submissions where we can and kind of, you know, joining groups like Renters United, I think is really great, but uh, I'll stop there because otherwise I'll keep going forever and ever. Hopefully we'll have more time to elaborate with questions as well. Thank you so much. Um, I will pass over to Byron then as well, if you've got any particular main points that um, are of your concern as well. Uh, kia ora again. Um, I, I think the first thing I want to say is that, um, you know, that's kind of been alluded to already, the, the kind of how applicable a lot of these, these areas are across these forms of discrimination. Um, so a lot of what Brody said, I think is very helpful, uh, especially thinking about Leah's story about the support that people will need to help get into, you know, a lot of, a lot of the support people receive are quite informal, you know, um, having friends help those kind of things, and especially how I, I mentioned, people have sent me in those in, in 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 their stead in those spaces. And even if it comes down to you know changing a name, um, I know a, a family who who had a Nigerian name, but would often after struggling for quite some time would change the English translation when applying. So you know these are very informal ways that people get assistance. But I think, like Bodhi said, we need to really incorporate a lot more um, formal structures to help people in those circumstances. Um, but I think for me, the biggest thing is actually coming back to what Nick and I both have mentioned, documentation. Um, there's so little out there already. Um, and I really think that documentation reporting these things, it, whether that be through you know, the media or, or the research uh, process that I'm currently doing, um, I think we're very, very important to, you know, I, I think New Zealand's one of those societies where a lot of people I speak to when it comes to race and they always mention how subtle it is. So there becomes this perception of, well, it's not really a big issue or it's not a big deal. And the lack of research kind of point, you know, points that people just not taking it very seriously. Um, so I think that in itself will do quite well. Um, but recently, um, Leah and I were actually on the Black House with um, Nuruddin, who's just been um, elected to council. And one of the, the, the conversations we had was having um, people who uh, have, you know, histories of discrimination, uh, those community members in those decision making processes. Um, you know, having that representation. Um, Nick mentioned, um, you know, the kind of unintended consequences of policies or, or, or framings that people create that because those people aren't on those decision making processes, there's often uh, um, get major gaps. Um, so those are kind of the main things that come to mind. 
Kia ora, thank you. Um, yeah, it just feels like I think in general when we've spoken so much about um, power in these spaces that it's when, when people are so um, desperate to have a home and to be safe in that home, that's not an easy way to go public with a story or to report experiences you've had. So it really speaks to needing to collect evidence of this that isn't just an individual story. People keep close to them because they felt like it was the only option, you know? So this is um, um, this is a really great conversation. Um, okay, I will pass on to Nick then. Please, Nick. Yeah, kia ora koutou. Um, I think from my perspective, what's been really important um, coming from the disability sector where, where we tend to focus on a fairly narrow band of, of issues um, has been that that intersectionality of the conversation tonight and bringing it over into uh, and being supported by Renters United to do that. So I think um, <clears throat> enabling that 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 cross fertilization of um, movements to come together because I think we we really do start to um, increase the the power of the social movement when when we bring other movements together. So I think from my perspective, that, that's one thing, um, bringing multiple movements together. Um, yeah, so, so I, I would encourage um, yeah, you to continue bringing disability movement, other movements together to, to really make it a, a really wide um, social movement around this. Um, I mean, I think there's a couple of things. There's, there's like from, from where I'm sitting, there's structural reform that needs to happen around around how our our houses, which are flats, effectively need to be need to be more accessible. And this is a specific issue to us. Um, and then there's we need to just be putting constant pressure on Kainga Order, uh, who do provide most of the housing in this space, to make their housing stock more accessible. Um, and, and that's something that that we need to do. But I think that's I come back to the perspective around and if that pressure is coming from different perspectives and, and different points then then I think that's that's useful um, the other thing that I was thinking about was around um, I I work in my day job um, in an organization that comes under the health and disability code of practice um, which has a code of rights so anything that we deliver in terms of our service if something goes bad, then ultimately one of our customers has a right to take a complaint back to the Health and Disability Commission. Um, it seems to me that housing is such a fundamental right of everyone in our country that we, we're not taking it seriously enough in terms of the complaint process, you know, if something goes wrong, that, that we need to really supersize the complaint process around what happens if something goes wrong, no matter what it is. But today we're talking about racism and discrimination. And, and we really need to take it seriously and, and give a complaint mechanism that costs nothing and is easy to enforce and is really serious. You know, the, the, the penalties around this stuff need to be pretty serious that, that landlords and property owners need to be really fearful of. Um, but costs the, the the tenant nothing. It, is, it needs to be absolutely free to take it. It needs to be easy, no lawyers involved. Get the lawyers out. This is just, you know, a if, if you have an issue with your landlord, you take it and it gets resolved. The penalties are applied. There you go. It, 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 I'm just astonished that we have no code of practice, code of rights in this space. We need to get really serious about this. Um, we've got it in other spaces, but in this space, so yeah, so that for me would be an absolute beginner for this one. Yeah, so that's that's where I'm going to finish on that one. Thank you. Um, that is a great idea, I think. And I also think what you say about it being the intersectionality of this being really important. It's like there's a lot of people affected. And I think we also, we will benefit from housing that is safe and accessible and that we feel comfortable within. So that's something we can, 
um, surely have a good broad movement towards in this space. So I'm glad we've been able to have a chat about it. I also was wondering if Leah, would you have anything you'd like to say? I don't want to um, mute you on this situation. Do you have any point you'd like to add to this part of the convo? Yeah. Um, I actually want to agree with uh, what everything that Nick said. 100% there needs to be more regulation and oversight of real estate agents and landlords, both their overt and their covert uh, practices. Um, and more assertive action on them, uh, real estate and landlords, who discriminate as it being part of their job. Um, it shouldn't be acceptable. It shouldn't never be an acceptable excuse to discriminate, you know, especially on the part of their client, the, the owner. You know, uh, that, and that being a part of their job to do that, I think um, really needs to be seriously looked at. And like what Nick was saying, um, penalties should be serious. It should hurt their pocket. Um, it, it should be made how lot they should be made um, fearful of actually being in that in that area, because uh, like I said, having experienced homelessness and um housing and security for a large part of my early life until I got into um state housing and and council housing um it's it, a lot of my tr personal trauma is situated around housing like I I mean when I came back from Australia I was so stressed out and so like I actually had a, my first interview with the council to get into housing, the guy who was the head of the housing um, unit at that time and did the interviews, the first things he said to me was, housing's not a right, it's a privilege. And I stopped the interview and, and, I, and I just walked out and I said, this is the re, and I'd just come back. I said, this is, I went walked out into the foyer and there was a bunch of guys in suits there. I said, this is the reason that you have a situation out there of homeless people because you employ people like this to actually run their housing offices, you know, the, the housing unit and interview people and they pass on their own discrimination. Um, I stopped the meeting and basically uh, was taken to a room in, by the security officer who basically said oh you can't talk to this guy like that and I said I I've talked to meaner and uglier people working on the mines in Australia so I don't really give a damn I'm going to talk to the boss I want to see the boss because since when has housing been a privilege in New Zealand now I've been away for 10 years so maybe it had changed I don't know but um I got my I got my council house soon after that because I wrote a formal complaint and basically that guy has been sacked from council because he wasn't only uh, doing things like that. He was, he was intimidating tenants. He was doing a lot of stuff. So when you've got these kind of characters that are actually your tenancy liaison officers and they've got this kind of practice with their tenants that are trying to intimidate them into silence or intimidate them into like being smaller than they actually are, that's not okay, you know? And I also believe that uh, this thing that they've got right now for um, for Wellington City housing tenants not being able to have access to the income related rent subsidy, I think that anybody who can qualify for a kainga or a housing register, if you can qualify for that, you should be able to qualify for income related rent subsidy. Now, right now, um, anybody who's a current tenant of Wellington City Council does not qualify they will not they they don't have access and that was brought in by the national government so when they do change over to a community housing project it's new tenants taken off that register that will have access to income related rent subsidy the rest of us are going to be paying a different rate and i think that's unfair i think anybody who qualifies if you're in because basically city council housing tenants would be in kainga aura if Kainga Aura was building houses and enough for people. And the fact that they haven't is why you've ended up in council, right? So I don't think it's a true, like what the government's doing is a true reflection of the need because they've actually 
put a barrier down between those that are already in council and those that are on the housing register. So my advice is to anybody who's in Wellington City Council, get your name on the housing register and then we can um, strategically attack that from another position. But um, yeah, I, I think, yeah, that, you know, the fact that we are in what they call social or public housing, you know, with council and the fact that it's becoming quickly unaffordable because of their 70% market rate thing is wrong because you know there's so many people here that are on low incomes fixed incomes pensions that would otherwise qualify for kayanga aura if the, if the houses were there and um you can't help but wonder why there isn't enough uh of a push for that with government uh, just go and look at how many houses a lot of the mps own you know <laughs> that's, what I have to say, that's what I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a great point. And I think um, what Byron was saying earlier about people in the room is really important. We don't have, um, we do we have any renters, maybe one renter in government? It's been very few. Um, so these these voices aren't there. And, and whether or not people are trying, you can't understand the situation um, really. So I think, um, uh, thank you everyone so much. Hopefully, we have one question in the Q and A, um, and everyone else in the audience, if you would, if you have a question, please pop it in there, and Ruby and I will facilitate and see um, if we can have some discussion or some have have some um, questions answered. Um, can all of my speakers see those questions? See that question? Um, got one here. Sorry, we're just reading this one here. Um, so this question is really asking um, when when you're thinking about people that have multiple intersectionalities, multiple intersections of discrimination that mean that their only choice might be social housing since the private market is so inaccessible, but then also given that social housing is also not up to standard, what changes do you think that the government needs to implement to help people with multiple intersectionalities or intersections of discrimination? I'm sorry if I misrepresented that question. I was just trying to speak it as well. And anyone can step in to answer if there's anything um, you would like to contribute there. Um, I'll start just briefly. I think something that comes up in my work a lot is um, kind of thinking about the social housing register and how we make those assessments and what is considered, I think, because, um, you know, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think it really does need updating and something that particularly comes up for Takatapu and LGBTIQ communities, particularly the trans community, is that you know, that's just not considered as a factor, but it's such a massive source of discrimination in every part of life for a lot of people, you know, it affects people's employment opportunities and their housing opportunities and the healthcare that they can access and all those sorts of things. And, you know, can make it really, really hard for people to gain secure and stable, affordable housing. And I think that's something that we often need to consider. So maybe, um, you know, thinking about how we, assess people for the social housing register and what different factors we take into account in that process, I think is important. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I know um, how we've considered um, who the government houses has changed a lot over time and the number of people that the government houses and to what standard they house them has really changed over the last um, decades. I know Vanessa Cole and quite a few other people are doing really good work thinking about what um, like an ambitious social housing project could be. Um, so is there anyone else that wants to speak to that question or we have one more question in the chat here yeah. as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, oh sorry, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just thinking um, exactly what, uh, you know, like what Brody was saying that uh, that the, sorry, can you say the question again? Because I've just gone blank. <laughs> Thinking really about um, when there's people experiencing intersection, uh, oh, yeah. discrimination from multiple intersections, really. I think when, to qualify for like the Kaying or housing register, I think the question, do you experience discrimination 
in certain areas of your life should actually be a question. It should be, it should be a question in there. And, you know, so that basically, yeah, if, if you experience or have experienced these things on a regular or basis or whatever, whether it's in housing or other aspects of your life, that that puts you on a, a bit of a back foot for, you know, for accessing um, private housing. So if we actually ask the question, or if Kainga Ora could ask the question, that would be that would be quite useful. Yeah, there's one thing that I would add on to this one because I think it's an interesting question. Um, personally, I've been I'm involved in, in engaging with Kainga Ora um, through their disability uh, leadership group um, around the accessibility of their properties, and and one of the things that that's come up has been around the way that they build properties now and, and also into the future for um, particularly um, Pacifica and, and, and Māori um, families in whānau because um, the way that they're building their properties right now um, is in quite a traditional way. Um, so one and two bedroom properties. And what's what they've been, what they've found out is that they need to build their properties to, to achieve much larger properties and, and in different configurations in order to make them accessible and also um, to um, to have larger families and whānau fitting within the properties and, and also the configuration within those properties. So, for example, uh, a bedroom on the ground floor, bathrooms on the ground floor, because at the moment the bedrooms and bathrooms bedrooms and bathrooms are all on the first level and, and if you've got um, elderly um, whānau and nāinga staying with you as, as happens in, um, in, in those communities you want them to be near to you so, um, so that's been a really interesting kind of um, bringing together of cultural and, and also accessibility um, requirements so I, I think it may not directly answer the question, but what it does do is talk to the way that intersectionality around universal design and accessibility is is driving the way that that they are choosing to to lead their design process. Um, it, it's certainly happening a lot, um, not not so much here in Wellington, but but in other parts of the country where where that that is really um, starting to happen. And I think it's a really good thing that that they are starting to look at, at who's going to use their their, their homes. Um, so yeah. Kia ora, thank you, Nick. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important point. It's like accessibility and whether the housing that's being built is culturally appropriate in any way. And um, I think the universal design thing is really needs to be part of this wider conversation as well. Um, I'm going to pass over to Ruby now to facilitate um, the next question. So thank you so much, everyone. Cool. Um, yeah. So we talked a little bit about. I guess, discrimination um, when you're in a flashing situation. So this question is asking about um, potential discrimination towards groups uh, by tenants who are letting space in a property uh, independently of the landlord. So they're just asking um, whether this has been an issue at all uh, for any of our speakers and whether you have any thoughts on how this could be combated given legislation could be more challenging to implement in this scenario. So if anyone would like to talk on that point? I, I feel like I could talk about that one for a while. It comes up quite a lot in my research um, for Tokataku and LGBTIQ communities. I think in part because, um, you know, the lower kind of age bracket that a lot of our community sits in and the lower income brackets that a lot of our community sits in is that a lot of us are flatting. I'm flatting. <laughs> um, and... It is a really, really common site of discrimination and marginalization for a lot of people. And it's quite a tricky thing to navigate, I think. You know, even um, things come up in my research of people who think that, you know, they found a queer friendly house and then it kind of turns out that maybe it's not. And those sort of different relationship dynamics. And it is really hard to legislate for that. I think it's quite a tricky thing. But I think, you know, a lot of the, um, issues that we've been talking about and the changes that we would like to see, I think that would all serve to help improve that situation and kind of make flooding a little bit better. But I do think we need to 
seriously think in New Zealand about, you know, the protections we have for people who are flooding, you know, it's quite different to if you are renting, you know, if your name's not on the lease, your rights are quite different and all those sorts of things. And you have to kind of negotiate, you know, your relationship with the landlord, but also your relationship with the flatmates and with the head tenant and whether or not you're on the lease and all those sorts of things can be quite tricky. So I think we kind of, yeah, need to think about that and how that can change and what rights um, flatmates have and kind of thinking about, um, you know, how do we protect people? And again, I think that reporting of discrimination and kind of legislating for people to have certain rights and kind of including flooding in that, I think is, will go a long way. But uh, I think it's an area that we need to kind of think about a little bit more. And again, it's very under-researched, like all of these areas that we've been talking about. Cool, yeah, thanks for that, Brody. Um, did anyone else want to talk to that question? No, that's all good. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I was thinking, like, the, the question's all very interesting. They're all quite difficult. And Brody's mentioned, you know, like, the, the, the legislative approach to it all becomes quite difficult. Um, but I, I think about, you know, some of the background reading I've done about the rental structure itself. Um, you know, home ownership declined heavily in the 1990s. And it, it felt as if rental legislation was never intended to... Renting was ever intended to be a form of housing long term, but that's changing now. And I feel like a lot of the issues we've spoken about today need to be consider taken into consideration in like kind of a rewriting of the way people are living now, because renting has become much more of a the rental population is going up. People are renting for longer. People are renting um, long term with families. And I, I, you know, a lot of the issues we've spoken about already. Um, just indicates to a you know a new writing or a new framework in which a lot of this legislation should be written in. You know the the, interse the intersectionality question was pretty interesting because it made me think a lot of using intersectionality as like a legislative um, framework almost. You know, just really thinking about. I mean, that's that's typical of me. You know, sociologist. You know, <laughs> we think a lot about um, systems change, which obviously is very difficult to do. We know that. Um, but you know, it's these these again this, the the documentation to, to begin this process of rethinking the way we're doing stuff yes completely agree um that i think housing yeah definitely needs to be looked at at how it's actually yeah, meeting people's needs and whether it actually is doing that because i think a lot of the legislation is definitely out of date and does not provide the grounds to do that yeah um I think we don't really have any more questions. So unless there's any other points that anyone wants to talk on before we wrap up. No? Cool. Um, Lane, do you wanna? Um, I guess, yeah, I could say I could speak for a second and then I'll um, give it over to Ruby to talk a little to finish us off and um, kind of bring it back to what we're trying to do as Renters United. Um, so I really just want to say thank you so much to all of the speakers for coming along today. I feel like it's been um, such a good combination of personal experience um, and different kinds of research and critical thinking that have been happening in this space and really um, acknowledging how um how so many of these struggles seem to have similarities across in which we can see spaces to build solidarity um and a broad movement to really argue for systems change as you said so it's um really conceptualizing this idea that um a flat isn't a kind of a short-term way of living as a student for like a young pakiha person it's um how people are living will continue to live and we want that to be um, secure and equally kind of um, be able to consider it your home, surely that should be the goal. Um, so I just wanna say thank you to everyone. I've had a really great evening um, and this hopefully will be available for people to watch at a later date. So it's been live, but will also be a resource to go forward from this point onwards as well. Um, so I'll just pass it over to Ruby to speak for a little bit longer, but thank you so much everyone. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, again, um, thank you to everyone for participating. I think 
it's been a very insightful um, evening. And yeah, I guess as you've all mentioned, I think discrimination in housing particularly is just not very well researched, particularly in um, Aotearoa. And it is something that I think has come up a lot in um, the branch meetings for Renters United. So I really appreciate for people who are part of Renters United, but also those who might not be, but are interested um, in you all being able to yeah, just share your experiences and insight and understanding on all of this. Um, I think it's definitely something, I mean, yeah, renters are such a di diverse group and we've touched on the intersectionality of all these issues. So I think, yeah, it's definitely an area where Renters United want to do more work and yeah, we just really appreciate um, being able to have you guys. Yeah, so thank you. Um, if there's anything that any of you would like to say to finish off, that's also fine, but otherwise we can end the meeting. Cool. Well, that's it. Um, yeah, and as Celine said, this will be, this is recorded, so it'll be online. So if you do, anyone wants to share with anyone else that couldn't make it, then that's completely cool. Cool. Thank you. Have a good night.